Good morning again, everyone. Today, I will be concluding our three-part series in the book of John. Before we get into John, well, while I say this, why don't you pull out your Bibles. This morning, we're going to actually open our Bibles. If you didn't bring one, you can obviously use your phone, or there are some good pew Bibles right in front of you that you should be able to access. Um, some of you probably already know, but some of you may not know, I'm going to be leaving for a couple of weeks. Um, it's been three years since I have gotten the opportunity to visit my family in Brazil, grandparents, aunts and uncles, siblings, nephew, niece, uh, my dad. And so, um, as you know, that's where I'm originally from. And uh, I'm grateful for this small window of opportunity that I believe God has opened for me to go. So you won't be seeing me actually for three Sabbaths because my first Sabbath coming back, I'll be at the Estacada Church. So um, in my absence, of course, Melissa and the kids will be here. Um, I'm sad that they can't go, but they'll be around. So you'll be seeing them. So I ask for your prayers and uh, just remember me. There are a lot of challenges with travel, as you know, nowadays. And so I'm praying that they'll let me out of the country and I'm praying that they'll let me back in the country. So um, please keep me in prayer. Um, we're in the book of John. So the good news is we're only going to stay within the book of John today. So you're not going to have to go all over your Bibles. But there are several passages I want to read in John. We're going to start with John 20 just by way of review. In John chapter 20, we have a story that John tells us of a follower of Jesus named Thomas who was not with the other apostles when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared. Um, and so he didn't see Jesus. He didn't touch Jesus. The ten disciples tell Thomas, our Lord is risen. He is alive. Thomas says, I will not believe it unless I see for myself, unless I touch, unless I hear him. And so we have the story of Jesus mercifully and kindly appearing to Thomas. And he says to Thomas, Thomas, touch here. Look at my hands. Touch, it, touch my side. And as, G, as Thomas sees Jesus and as he hears Jesus, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And he believes, yes, Jesus is risen. And Jesus says something to Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 29, which is really just a very important passage in the whole book. Jesus says to Thomas, he says, Have you believed me because you have seen? Have you believed me because you saw me and touched me? Jesus says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And in the next two passages, John tells us why he wrote the book. Verses 30 and 31. Jesus did many other signs, many other miracles in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, the ones that are written, the stories that were collected by John and put into this book, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John is the last of the apostles alive when he wrote this book. He's writing to a generation of people who were not alive when Jesus lived. They were not alive. They were not present to see Jesus resurrected, to see many of the miracles and many of the experiences that the apostles had after Jesus ascended to heaven. John is writing, and he specifically puts this story of Thomas, and he records the words of Jesus to Thomas, Blessed are those who believe, though they have not seen. And if you go through the book of John, John is essentially making the point that those like you and me today who have not seen, touched, or heard Jesus are not at a disadvantage compared to those who did. Now, it seems as though we are, because we 
pray for sick loved ones and we don't see healing many times. We see death, we see suffering, we see pain. We don't get to see God. He's invisible to us. My kids wonder. They've begun to ask this question. Why is God invisible? You know, why can't we see angels? Why is Jesus not performing miracles today the way he did 2,000 years ago? In the car as we drove to church this morning, Abigail asked that question. And my kids are bringing up these very difficult questions that I have to be very honest with them often and say, I really don't know why. But one thing that I find as I read the book of John, John claiming to be an eyewitness, claiming to have been there, claiming to have seen, claiming to have touched, claiming to have heard, he believes that those who did not see are not at a disadvantage. For John, those who did not see are not at a disadvantage compared to those who did. And throughout the book of John, there are stories that are going to illustrate this. And so we're going to go back to John chapter 4. We looked at this last week. In John chapter 4, we have here the story of a woman in Samaria. We looked at this last week. This woman had an experience with Jesus. She was Samaritan. He was Jewish. She was not a very likely uh, candidate to become a believer in Jesus, but she, after spending time with him, she left excited to tell her uh, acquaintances in town that, I believe I found the Messiah. She was under conviction. These people from the town of Sychar in Samaria never saw Jesus, never saw a miracle, but they saw the enthusiasm of this woman who believed she had experienced something special and was telling everybody about it. They, because of her enthusiasm and conviction, they believe her and they go to find out. And when they go... They hear him, they're in his presence, and they come under conviction. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 4, verse 39, many Samaritans from that town, the town of Sychar, many of them believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And then we read in verse 41 of John chapter 4, And many more believed because of his word. They listened. They spent time in his presence. They heard his teachings. And they come under conviction. Notice in this story, no miracles, nothing glamorous. Jesus was an ordinary man. He was a part of the sub-elite of society. He was from an obscure a town of disrepute named Nazareth from the region of Galilee. Jesus was not on the surface anyone special that drew attention to himself. But his word, his teaching, his character, that's all they got. And it says in verse 42, after spending time with Jesus, they said to the woman... It is no longer because of what you said that we believed. For we have heard for ourselves. And what does the next phrase say? And now we what? We know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Don't miss this. This is very important. These Samaritans, unlikely believers in Jesus, a Jew from Galilee, to be the promised of God, the one sent from God, they see no miracles. They heard from this woman that he performed a miracle by telling her about her life, things that he didn't know couldn't have known, so they believe based on her witness, but then they go and they experience for themselves, but there's no record of signs and wonders. In the same chapter, in John chapter 4, 
beginning in verse 46, we have another story about a Jewish nobleman whose son is sick. Well, Jesus is approached by this man, and there's a request for healing. And Jesus, in his love and mercy, heals the nobleman's son. You can read the story in its entirety. It's a short story, verses 46 to 54. But I want to draw your attention to verse 48. Notice how John here in John 4, verse 48, records the words of Jesus to this man. Jesus said to him in verse 48, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now you can't miss this. There is a contrast here between the Jewish nobleman and the Samaritans. Because the Samaritans believed without signs and wonders. Are you following? No miracle. They hear the words of God spoken through Jesus. They spend time in His presence. They encounter His character. And they not only believe, but now they know that this is the promised sent of God. The one we've been waiting for. If you go throughout the book of John, you will notice this pattern. There were many who believed. And many who did not believe. In spite of miracles that they witnessed. Turn with me to John chapter 6 for just a moment. And we're about to go to John 9. And in John 9, there's a story that I want to bring to your attention. But in John chapter 6, just notice here the language. John chapter 6, verse 2. John's making a point here, and I hope we don't miss it. It says in John chapter 6, verse 2, a large crowd was following him. Why were they following him, according to the text? Because they saw the miracles that he was doing on the sick. And Jesus did another miracle that day. He fed all of them by multiplying five loaves and two pieces of fish. But John is very specific here. They believed in him because of the miracles. Do you know what happens when you believe because of these miracles? When trials come, you walk away. That's what we read here in John chapter 6. If you keep going to the end of the chapter, it says in John chapter 6, verse 66, the Bible says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. These were the same ones that followed him, which is a superficial way of believing, they followed him because of the miracles. If you go back to John chapter 2, just flip those pages. John chapter 2. John's making this point over and over again. John chapter 2 verse 23. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. But what does it say? They believed when they saw the signs. That's another word for miracles. They believed in his name when they saw the signs, the miracles that he was doing. Was Jesus impressed that they were following, believing because of miracles? Verse 24, it says, But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus was not impressed with people that were just excited because of the miracles. Because one thing you will find in the book of John is that if there aren't deeper roots... If there isn't an experience of knowing his character, 
when trials come, when disappointments come, people walk away. In John chapter 11, there's the story of the greatest miracle of all. A man named Lazarus was raised from the dead. And the account we have in John chapter 11 and then John chapter 12 is that there were some who were angry after Lazarus was raised from the dead. Miracles, demonstrations, sensational happenings is not what keeps people faithful to God. Look at the story of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. If miracles was the cure-all, there would have been no rebellion, no disbelief, no turning back. They watched God part the Red Sea, bring bread from heaven, cause water to gush out of a rock. And every time a new trial appeared, every time a new trial came on them, we find them complaining and disbelieving and murmuring and complaining about God. So we have John chapter 9. This is the story. And we've been talking during the last three Sabbaths about the difference between believing and knowing. And we, we know that many people believed. Many people believed in Jesus because of the miracles. You know, if you watch a man take five pieces of bread and two pieces of fish and feed 5,000 plus, you become a believer too. But there's a, an experience that has to go deeper than just the sensational. And Jesus brings this out over and over again. John, as he's recording the stories, brings this out. We have a, a story here of a man who was born blind in John chapter 9. The disciples, they were wondering, why was this, more, why was this man born blind? Note, notice just how bad their theology is. The question they asked Jesus is, why was this more man born born blind? Is it because he sinned or is it because his parents sinned? And Jesus said, neither. You're asking the wrong question. He wasn't born blind because of sin. He was born blind because the works of God would be manifest and displayed in him. That's John chapter 9 verse 3. Well, Jesus will actually go and talk to this man and he will tell him, after he puts some mud on his eyes to go and wash, and the man is healed from his blindness. He can see. This man has an encounter, an experience with Jesus. Jesus opens his eyes, and the people, they are wondering what happened. Verse 8 says in John chapter 9, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, isn't this the man who had used to beg? How is he able to see now? The people are marveling. Some said, it's him. Others said, no, it just looks like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. And so then we read in verse 13 of John chapter 9. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. And this is why I believe John is correct that we are not at a disadvantage to those who actually saw. You have the Pharisees and many others who were there. They had the opportunity to interview. Now the Pharisees didn't know this man but they heard that Jesus healed this man and they didn't want to believe. And so we read here in John chapter 9, verse 13, they brought the to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Verse 14 says, and it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Verse 15, so the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. 
They don't want to believe this. Believing that Jesus healed this man from blindness would go against every theory they had about Jesus. So he said to them, the blind man said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. See, Jesus' practice of healing people on the Sabbath went against their theology. And so in spite of the miracles that were obvious in front of them, especially here in the person of this man who had been blind, they're still going to resist the evidence. This is why miracles in and of themselves will not do. If it was about miracles, it would have turned believers out of these Pharisees. If you have preconceived ideas, if you have cherished theories, and God directs you in a direction that goes against those ideas, even if he were to send a dead person or an angel from heaven, you still would not believe. This is the point that John is making in this story. The Pharisees refused to believe that this man had been born blind. Verse 17, So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? And the blind man said, He is a prophet. Verse 18, The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called his parents... Verse 19, and they asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Verse 20, his parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. This was a lie, by the way. The parents, understanding that this was very controversial and that they would be on the wrong side of influential people, decided that it would be better to lie and say, we don't know how he was healed and we don't know the man who healed him. And then in verse 22, it explains why they felt they had to lie. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. That was uh, a tactic of control that uh, influential people in Jewish society used to manipulate people into doing what they wanted them to do. Excommunication. You're separated, disconnected from God if you don't do what we're telling you. That tactic's been used in other centuries by religious leaders. Verse 23 says, Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So, verse 24. So, for the second time, they, the Pharisees, called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give God glory. We know that this man is a sinner. The Pharisees, their big agenda here was not to sort out blindness or no blindness. They just wanted to portray Jesus as a phony, as a fake, as one who was not on God's side. That was their whole goal. The blind man, he's not going to get into a theological argument with the Pharisees. How could he? They could quote the Old Testament a lot better than he could. He is not in a position to debate who's the Messiah and what the Messiah is supposed to look like. What can the blind man do? All he can do is what you and I can do. Tell our experience. Tell what has happened 
to him. So this is one of the most beautiful passages in the book of John. Verse 25, the blind man answered, and he said, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. And please notice these words. One thing I do know. Do you see that? We've been talking the last three Sabbaths about the difference between believing and knowing. This man could not prove from Scripture that Jesus was the Messiah. But one thing he knew that nobody could take away from him. And what was that? What did he know? One thing I know, he said, that though I was blind, now I see. Did you catch that? Richard Dawkins, I've mentioned to him before, mentioned him before to you. He is the most prominent atheist in the world. He wrote the book, The God Delusion. I'm not recommending you read the book. But in the book, he explains why he believes the God of the Bible is a fabrication of human invention. There's a documentary, a really good documentary, I do encourage you at some point to watch if you have time. It's called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. Any of you just curious ever watch that? I'm telling you, it's a great documentary. Have you heard of an actor, a Jewish actor named Ben Stein? Okay, Ben Stein is the one that Uh, wrote the documentary, and he appears in the documentary. In the documentary, he interviews Richard Dawkins. The purpose of the documentary is simply to prove that intelligent design versus no intelligent design is a credible scientific proposition. And he does a great job of proving that. And in his interview with, with Richard Dawkins, who believes there is no God and that religion is a terrible thing, and the world would be better without it. At one point, Ben Stein asks Richard Dawkins, what if there was a God, and if one day you appeared before God, what would you say to him? Richard Dawkins says, and he actually quotes another author, he says, sir, why did you take such pains to hide yourself? And I think that that is a challenge And we have to face it. The things we read about in the Bible regarding miracles in terms of multiplying food and healing sick people and raising dead people are not experienced today, at least not with the frequency we would like it to happen, right? We have to admit it. And the children wonder and the young people wonder and some of them have a hard time believing because of it. And I believe that the thesis of the book of John is simply this. You can know. And once you know, no one can take it away from you. The blind man was under a great deal of pressure. If you keep reading the story, because he was unwilling to lie about what had really happened, he was put out of the synagogue and basically excommunicated, shunned by his family and community, okay? Because he would not lie about what had happened. A great deal of pressure. But they couldn't take away from him what he knew to be true. This I know, he said. I was born blind and now I see. Now, you can argue philosophically, theologically, and scientifically all you want that God is not there, that he doesn't exist, and that religion is a sham. But one thing you cannot take away from me is that once I was blind, now I see. And Jesus has an encounter with these people in verse 40. Some of the Pharisees 
near him heard these things and said to him, this is the Pharisee speaking to Jesus, are we all so blind? And Jesus said to them in verse 41, Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Jesus was essentially saying, you're the blind ones. And I want to say to you today, at the age of 16, there was a fog in my life. You know how sometimes in life, the fog is so thick, you can't really think straight and make good decisions? You lack clarity. And some people, if you were to ask me, what did Jesus do for you? You know, the cliche answer, and it's fine, you know, he saved me. He gave me eternal life. And to me, I, I say, even if there was no eternal life, even if there was no heaven, it still was the best decision I ever made at the age of 17 to give my life to Jesus. Because he cleared the fog in my life. I'm not saying my life has not had challenges. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at the age of 30. I've gone through trials, as we all do in this life. But the fog has cleared. And one thing no one can take away from me, as a teenager, it was a foggy, cloudy, depressing, sad journey. And then at the age of 17, all of a sudden, the fog cleared. And Jesus gave me clarity. The reason I believe in Jesus is because I had an experience at the age of 17. And friends, it was not food multiplying. It wasn't a dead person coming to life. It, it was nothing dramatic. He cleared my thinking and he broke the chains of addiction in several areas in my life. And with that, I know no one can take it away. I can't debate, and I can't win an argument with very intelligent, prominent, scientifically-minded atheists in the world. But like the blind man in the story, one thing I know, once I was blind, now I see. For me, the greatest miracle that really roots us in him is victory over sin when he breaks the chains of addiction in our lives. And we all have those areas, big or small, that we struggle. And when we're in the presence of God, and we know him as he is willing to make himself known to us, those chains break. And that is the miracle that keeps us parting the Red Sea and multiplying food, as we read in the uh, record of Scripture, can be very superficial in terms of keeping people rooted. I've talked a lot last three Sabbaths, I'll end on this note, about knowing God. And I really believe that as a young person, I had an experience with him at the age of 17. Not to say I have not had my moments of backsliding and faithlessness. I worry about things I shouldn't worry. I've made my mistakes. I have not in any way been perfect since I gave my life to Jesus. But I continue on the path that I'm on and I'm under conviction that he is real and that he is good and that Jesus is coming and he is going to put an end to the mess of sin that our world is in. I believe all of this because... I encountered him. And I've talked a lot about knowing God, and I want to end on a practical note. You know, knowing God versus merely believing and coming to church and being religious, knowing God actually happens through the Word of God. It's not a mystical experience detached from actually knowing him through really the one thing we have that he's given us other than nature 
because in nature he's left his fingerprints. And you can get to know God through nature. It's incredible. That's what the intelligent design debate is really all about. It's like God has actually left his fingerprints in nature to make himself known. And Romans chapter 1 talks about that. But in the Bible, God has actually told us about his character. And as you actually encounter him in the Bible, people do change. The Spirit of God actually works. But I know that it's hard to find that routine. Um, I, I'm, I struggle with it. But at the age of 17, and this was, I think, the high spiritual point in my life. And then later I got married, had kids, and life got busy. And, you know, it's hard to find that routine. I'm with you. I'm the pastor, and I'm with you. If you're struggling to find a routine in your life that actually has room for God, not just religion. I know you come to church. I know you volunteer at the church, some of you volunteer in a number of areas but you know what at the end of the day knowing God requires an actual experience in quietness with him in the word when I was 17 and I'll say this from the age of 17 to 21 22 last year of high school four years of college I had this routine and this is where my faith was built Knowing God, reading the Bible, but sometimes where do you start? You know, everyone I think that tries to read the Bible inevitably has to find a source of uh, aid in reading the Bible. And so I would like to recommend something to you. We have the book Desire of Ages. Um, Read, read your Bible, read the Gospels with Desire of Ages as a commentary. If you're struggling, if you're having a hard time finding a, a routine in your life where you actually open your Bible and read, not, not to prepare a children's story or a sermon, but just to encounter God. It doesn't have to be long periods. We make room in our lives for anything that we find to become a priority. You know, growing spiritually does not happen without prioritizing God in our lives. And I want to make a distinction between religion and actually knowing God. The book Desire of Ages, as well as the book Patriarchs and Prophets and Prophets and Kings and Acts of the Apostles, four books. Some of you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, please see me after the, the sermon. I have some copies for those of you that don't have. Some of you have the book Desire of Ages, and it may be collecting dust in your bookshelf. These books are companions as you read through the Bible. You don't have to start in Genesis. You can start in the Gospels. If you decide to start in the Gospels... You take the book Desire of Ages. Every chapter in the book Desire of Ages, or most chapters, have the scripture, and it'll tell you based on, and they'll tell you the scripture, whether it's in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Reading, and I got emotional a moment ago because I was remembering uh, my moments with Jesus in, in college. Waking up early. And it doesn't have to be in the morning. It can be in the evening. But boy, waking up early and just having those encounters. And that's where the chains of sin broke. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Some of you are struggling. Some of you um, are going through the motions of religion and are you know, Paul talks about it in 2 Timothy, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And I think many of you have experienced that power at some point, and maybe like it says in Revelation chapter 3, you've lost that first love. And you want it back. 
And, you know, I'm just giving you a suggestion here. Take 30 minutes out of your day. Just like you make appointments for your doctor or for work, put it on your calendar, put it on your agenda. And if you feel like it's boring at first, you're not understanding, I tell you, that's where this comes in, the companion. Choose portions of the gospel. Read stories from the Bible in the gospel and then read the corresponding commentary in the book, Desire of Ages. Pray and say, Lord, break the chains of sin in my life. As a pastor, you get to know people and you get to see uh, how dysfunctional we all are. I say we, the pastor's dysfunctional too. If you spend enough time in my home, you'll see how dysfunctional we are. We're all dysfunctional as human beings. We need to know God. We're going to end today singing Amazing Grace 108. We're going to turn to 108, Amazing Grace. And we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 5. Father in heaven, Lord, in nature, you've left fingerprints telling us that you are there, that someone very intelligent designed everything we see. And in the Bible, you've given us a picture, a more accurate and specific picture of what you look like, your character. And as we contemplate, as we behold your character, we change. Your spirit works. Your spirit transforms us, breaks the chains of sin in our lives. And Lord, today my prayer for our congregation is that we will know you. Because I believe that like that Samaritan woman, when she knew Jesus was the Messiah, the conviction, the enthusiasm, the certainty of her word was contagious and a whole city came to see for themselves. And Lord, we're here in the city of Sandy and I believe that if we as a church come to know you the way you desire to be known, that we will be a blessing in this community. So Lord, I pray for each one. I pray for those that are here today because they want to get to know you. They believe because they've heard and they've come to check it out. 
and they are listening, they are trying to understand, and I pray that you will reveal yourself to them in a very real way, and that you will use us as a church to reveal you to them in our character, in our lives. So Lord, bless us in our mission. We thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.